Hey everybody, this is Mike McGranner, producer and director of the current version of Night Owl Theater, and you are getting ready to experience with us episode one of Conversations with the Owl. This all began when writer Vitas Barzdukas and myself would come hang out with Fritz and we'd talk movies, comics, jazz music, the world, the weather, and everything else, and we'd be very candid, and we just thought it would be neat, since Fritz is now retired from doing personal appearances, to invite you all in onto Fritz's Planet Zontar with us to be a part of the fly on the wall for these conversations. And so uh, the man is a legend. He was born before TV, and he has now lived through every medium of entertainment and is now starting his own podcast. So it's pretty amazing. So now sit back, relax, dim the lights, and get ready for episode one of Conversations with the Owl. And greetings, good groovers, Earth people, 14 viewers out there in the darkness. Your voice of the night, Fritz the Night Owl, here talking with uh, Mike and Vitus and uh, going back uh, over the years of being a comic book junkie since I was born in 1934 and uh, always a delight to find, back in my day, you couldn't find adults who would talk about comic books or superheroes or science fiction, so it's so great to be able to, uh, as a geezer, be able to recall all of these great characters and artists, etc., etc., etc. And nothing is off the table. No subject. We'll talk about uh, your upbringing and your career in entertainment and your favorite movies, your music, your likes, dislikes, and Vitus and I are here just to you know, comment because we are fans of you. And I think that that's the thing is we're the voice of the fans and we're wanting to hear anything and everything about you and your life. Which is a nice way of saying, I warped your mind as a child and <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to lie too much. <laughs> well, uh, I guess the first place to start would be, uh, not to be cliche or anything, but it is episode one. And as with every pilot, we uh, want to talk about uh, your small town of Nakusa, Wisconsin growing up. Well, it was terrific because uh, in those days, there was no television, there was no internet. So all us kids had for entertainment were all of the outdoor sports. Uh, in winter, the river would freeze over, so we would ice skate and uh, we would play essentially sandlot hockey on the river and our puck was a chunk of, of coal and uh, our hockey sticks I think one kid owned a real hockey stick and the rest of us were using brooms and baseball bats and anything that could hit that lump of coal and uh, so forth but it was like movies once a week there were the movies and of course the, the Saturday afternoon uh, was for kids and they'd have like uh, two adventure pictures a Tarzan or a Western and they'd always have like one of the serials and of course your parents could keep your behavior and your grades good simply by threatening to withhold the money for the um, Saturday afternoon movie and of course uh, it was World War uh, two going on so my father was uh, in the Wisconsin National Guard, which was one of the first uh, units activated. So he left around, well, it was December 7th, 41, and he was gone by before Christmas of that. And then we only saw be, uh, between then and 1946, we didn't see him except for once, one week he got a leave, but most of the time he was stationed in uh, in the Pacific Theater and uh, was in the infantry which turned into chemical corps which he was an, so I was an army brat but uh, we didn't see my dad for well it was for, uh, about uh, December late January of 42 until uh, the s summer of uh, 46 when he came back from overseas and oh, wow. we moved to uh, uh, an army base just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And, uh, well, living in a small town like Nikusa, which was central Wisconsin, so around Thanksgiving, the snow would hit, and we would have, like, at least a foot of snow on the ground until about, oh, mid-March. So it was a great great town to live in, and, uh, and um, 
we didn't, re you know, our, our version of the war was what we saw in the movies. So we didn't really, I, I never really realized the danger my father was right. in uh, during those years. So small, going from a small town like Nikusa, Wisconsin, and we also spent a lot of time up in northern Minnesota, Aurora, which was an iron ore mining town. Loved that. And also Appleton, Wisconsin, which was, um, which was uh, fairly close to Green Bay. So, so uh, anyway, like, like I say, it was, it was nice growing up in that town. Everybody knew everybody. And on Saturdays, we, would, we, we had no idea that, that a, an action comics number one was going to be worth over a million dollars, et cetera. <laughs> and we would trade comic books. Uh, so, so were your... Were your grandparents immigrants? Is that the, oh yeah, they were yeah. the first ones that came to the my States. my my um, my mother's side were Sicilians, and uh, my mother was the first of the uh, Italian Sicilian side of my family. She was the first one born in the United States, and the first one to be born up in northern Minnesota, which was all the uh, Swedes and Norwegians and Germans. And so the Italians up there were sort of considered the lowest, lay they were one step below the Native Americans. Okay. And um, th that was where essentially I had the first little glimmer of, of what prejudice was, because up in that area, being a, a Sicilian Catholic was pretty low on the, on the scale of... of Social acceptance. Right. When my one uncle married a, um, oh, she was either Norwegian or Swedish, my aunt, um, it was kind of like a town scandal that this nice Norwegian girl would marry a Sicilian. Uh, and it's so I say, it, it was kind of noth nothing like what was happening down south, but it was just a thing that uh, at age eight or nine, you couldn't remember why are these people looking at me sort of strangely. Right, and, right. You know. Um, right. Look, treating us a little bit less than what the other kids were treated like. So anyway, anyway, like um, I tend to ramble. So next, oh, no, that's, no, that's, that's what fine. the podcast is for. Yeah. Uh, so you're accustomed to the cold weather. I mean, that's like you got that down. You're, oh yeah. You're good. To, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, it sounds like you were very cold. The place where we up. lived up up uh, we would go up to northern Minnesota to visit my Italian grandparents. And the town of Aurora was maybe a hundred miles. It was a, about a hundred miles north of Duluth, and about a uh, hundred miles south of C Canada. So I mean, it was like major major league cold, but we loved it. Uh, right. So when you got to play hockey on the on the water, on uh, the river, yeah. or on the river, who was the one that drew the short straw that had to check and make sure it was all frozen? Heaviest kid. Uh, <laughs> Heaviest kid we had. <laughs> They're building course, building a the, fortress on Zonta yeah. right now. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the thing was, we used to have to shovel off the snow off the river, and that river would freeze so much that, uh, for some reason, there was a guy that owned a Piper Cub airplane, and he would come to Nikusa and land on the rivers. His Piper Cub had skis on the bottom. Oh wow! And I mean, it was thrilling. We'd hear that. We'd hear that engine in the distance, and I mean, every everybody would head for the river to watch this guy land, right? Do whatever business he had to do, and he'd land the plane and get off, walk across the river, go into town, do what he had to do. So, was so that one of those planes from like Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he like picks Indy up at the beginning? Is it that kind of plane? Well, it was. It was a real lightweight airplane. And the wing was over the top. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that kind yeah. of thing. And right. a very, very popular right. civilian-owned airplane. It was called a Piper Cub. Was the name of it. And another thing that used to draw the kids all the time. There was there was a guy who owned oh, it was like a thirty-seven or thirty-eight cord convertible. And I mean, oh, what a beautiful car that was. Right. So Until he drove it on the lake. And <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he, he, he'd come to town a couple of times a week to go. <laughs> Our downtown, uh, about every about every third building was a bar, and uh, it was a paper mill town. Okay. And um, so uh, he would come to town for something, but we would all head for, for, the, 
place where he would park and just sit there and ooh and ah over this beautiful cord convertible. Right. And, uh, if, if Shirley MacLaine is right and we come back, I'm going to buy a cord <laughs> convertible and a, a, a PBY Catalina flying boat, nice. et cetera, and also become a great jazz sax, saxophone player and, and a movie actor, if Shirley MacLaine is right. Right, right. So then what did you do? So when you moved to Baltimore, how old were you in? I was in uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade. And so I did seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth grade in Baltimore, and then we moved to Columbus. And then, and then when you were in Baltimore, if I remember correctly, this is where you went to Catholic school and yeah. learned Latin. We talked about that. Well, in my ninth and tenth grade, I went to, it was a private boys' school, a Catholic boys' school called Loyola. Right. And as part of the curriculum there, it was, if you spent four years at Loyola, you ended up having four years of Latin, three years of classical Greek, two years of either French or German, plus your regular history, English, religion, math, and so forth. But uh, so, so I took uh, two years of classical Latin and uh, one year of classical Greek. And... Um, then we moved to Columbus, and uh, I just took a regular pre-college right. course thing. And, of course, one of the things was, was I was one of the few guys that took typing simply because in the typing class there were maybe three guys and 40 girls. <laughs> right. So it was, um, <laughs> it was a gr great meeting place. Sure, yeah. You know, when you look like Woody Allen more than Rory Calhoun, right. uh, you needed all this, all the extra breaks. <laughs> all, all the you help could you can get, get yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So anyone out there, anyone out there listening with a, a real skinny body and glasses, just know that you two could be a ladies' man. Thanks to Fritz the Night Owl. That's right. And his advice. well, it was a, it was a lot of work in those days because again, we grew up. Uh, when we grew up, as a matter of fact, when when uh, I was working at Channel Ten. And in college, I was working for a guy named Bill Pepper, who was head newscaster at Channel 10. And he told me that uh, I would have to stay in radio because I, my voice and my looks were... I was not good-looking enough to be on television. The voice was, was terrific, but my physical thing didn't match the voice. If you're old enough to remember a movie called, a TV series called Jake and the Fat Man, uh -huh. the actor William Conrad was really a heavyweight guy. We're talking major league weight, but he was the voice of Matt Dillon on radio for Gunsmoke. Okay, right. And uh, in, in those days, uh, I, w I was a heavy radio listen listener, and uh, one of my influences was... Uh, Howard Duff, who play, played the radio Sam Spade, mm -hmm. and then went on to uh, be a uh, movie actor. And then another influence was Jeff Chandler, who played Michael Shane on radio, and then went on to be Mr. Boynton to Eve Arden's Armis Brooks on radio. But it was a thing, he was too good looking and too masculine looking to be the guy on t uh, Mr. Boynton, the the boyfriend of Miss Brooks on television, so they got another guy. And by that time, Jeff Chandler was a Major League Universal's number one leading man. So he was too good looking and too masculine to be on TV as this mild mannered, bashful, kind of socially inept right. boyfriend for Mr. Brooks. Um, go ahead, next question. Well, actually, uh Move back to Nakuza just for a second because I do have to ask you one thing. Mm -hmm. I believe you told me a few years back that uh, your mother knew Bob Dylan's mother somehow. Was that no, a my thing? grandmother? Grandmother, okay. Uh, knew him. Um, my grandmother used to, and my mother would would would. There was this lady whose son became the head of oh dear me, it was a fish company, but she made spaghetti sauce. And it was so good that she would sell it door to door in in uh, Aurora, and she would go up to the small towns around Aurora, Hibbing being one of them, which was Bob Dylan's hometown. And so my grandmother sold 
Mrs. Pellucci's spaghetti sauce to uh, Mrs. Uh, Zimmerman. Zimmerman, right. There, yeah. Well, that's awesome. So Bob would have been a, a baby at the same time. I think you and he are probably similar in age, so... Like, no, he, been a little kid. he would have been, he would have been, a, I'd say he'd be a good 10 years younger oh, okay. than me. Gotcha. Now, my cousins knew him vaguely. Wow. But uh, nice. my cousins who lived up there knew him vaguely. But, uh, no, I never met him. I only knew that uh, that there was a connection through my grandmother and uh, Mrs. Pellucci. I'm trying to think of the seafood company her son owned. It was a national brand, and Bob and Ray did the radio commercials. Was it the Gordon's Fisherman? No, no, no. It was <laughs> something. I forget what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but the commercials were so good because Bob and Ray did them. And, oh, wow. And um, I, 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 my geezer memory forgets the brand, but, I mean, it was as big as Mrs. Paul's or Gordon's. It was as... As big as that. Right. So then when you moved to Columbus, then you went to Ohio State. Yeah. And you were, what did you major in again? I started off in in, um, pre-law. It was a program, they had a six-year program called Arts Law, and you would get your BA and then your fourth year of law, your fourth year of arts college would be your first year of law school. Okay. And so then... uh, I, when I got interested in radio TV, I was always interested in it, but uh, I got a part-time job at TV and got hooked on that, so I switched over to uh, arts education so that if I couldn't get a job as an actor or a radio person, I would be able to teach and feed myself and family, et cetera, et cetera. Gotcha. Right. And then you joined the Army... Well, I didn't join. They <laughs> sent me one of they sent me one of those letters <laughs> that I was requested, and I went to the. Uh, it was a thing that had. I got I got the letter, and I wasn't sure when I was drafted. So I went down to the the draft board and I talked to this guy, a sergeant, and I explained. I said, "Look, you know, I'm going to supposed to graduate in June." When are they going to take me? And he said, well, they won't take you for a month, but after that month, any time after that, and any time after a month, it still would have been before I got graduated or married. And, but they had a program that was called Get Choice, Not Chance. And if you enlisted, if you had a job that the Army had, they would guarantee you that after basic, you would have that job in the Army. Right. And they had a television production, what they called MOS, Military Occupational Specialty. They had one for a radio TV a production assistant or, or production. And so he said, if, if you enlist now, I can give you a, a four-month deferment, which means you'll get to graduate, you'll get to get married. But in September of 57, you will absolutely positively be put on active duty, but he also said because of my three years of ROTC, I could go in the Army as a non-commissioned officer, a corporal, which was the two stripes, which was more money and uh, uh, less work. So I, I, I enlisted then in, uh, oh, it had to be maybe February, March, or April of uh, 1957, and then I went on active duty in September of 57, headed out to beautiful Fort Knox <laughs> to, uh, but, but actually I did basic in the fall, so it wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold, um, and as far as basic went, it was, we, everybody was glad to get out of it, and then when I was out of basic, they, they, uh, Gave me a uh, sent me to Washington D.C. where I was supposed to do radio TV there, and I got to D.C. and the guy says, "Well, we don't need somebody doing this," and he looked at my green sheet of you know stuff that was background, and they saw that it, at Ohio State for my phys ed requirement I had taken uh, swimming instruction and Red Cross life saving thing, 
So they put me in charge of, of this swimming class, beginning swimming class, which never showed up at the pool that I was at. <laughs> right. And so um, af- after that, I had an aunt there. Oh, dear me. I'm really going on. No, go. No, That's this is what well, this, this whole, this whole yeah. thing is for. Yeah. I had an aunt there who was kind of a big deal in politics, really knew a lot of people. And because I was a corporal, I didn't have to... And the class never showed up. I would go there at the pool at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I would hand out towels and mop the pool. And then at 2 o'clock, I would teach this class, which never showed up. And then I, at 2 o'clock, I would be free, and i just head into D.C. and go around. Only thing I mentioned in the course of, of, of with this aunt who was big in politics and knew every, that, I, that I'd heard of this place in New York City, Long Island City, where they made all of the movies for the uh, uh, army, and I'd really love to go there. And within, oh, three weeks, I had orders to head for Army Pictorial uh, Center, or Signal Corp Pictorial Center was the official name, in uh, Long Island City, which was the old New York Paramount Studios um, facility. And I mean, it was a thing that you could have dropped the whole Channel 10 building in on their main stage. It, right. was, it was like getting a doctorate in uh, movies. And th- then they also had the TV up there, but it was th- they didn't have uh, videotapes, so they would do training films on kinescope, which was much less expensive to do than, say, a 35-millimeter film so they had the 35 millimeter film stuff on one floor, and they had the television up on the other. But uh, say, like on kinescope, they could do 15 minutes in one shot, whereas with 35 millimeter, they had to each shot was separate. If if you had a a soldier opening the clip on his M1, they would light the M1 and they'd get a clo- right. close up of it, and you you. Okay, action, and you put the clip in and slide the bolts back and put the clip in and slide it, cut. Right. And then the next thing they'd set up where you standing up or a medium shot of this, that. Whereas with television, they, we had like four cameras at the same time, and one of them was a 16 millimeter. It would go up 16 feet. Uh, uh, oh, what do you call it? The thing was the on boom? a boom, yeah. yeah. And uh, I'd never seen one of those before. The camera would be on the. It's called a no, jib. just that. That was just for yeah. the mic. That was no. Or that's right. The, the camera and the mic would be on there. Yeah. Yeah. Can, and they would take two guys cool. would have to push it around, and the third guy would be up on their thing. So, so what did you learn there? Did you learn writing? <clears throat> did you act there? Did you? Well, I'd learned the I'd learned the writing and the acting at Ohio State. Uh, um, so what they would do is there would be a film that we had to, a training film that we had to make on, on uh, Kinescope. And th- 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 they would assign each guy, okay, on this film you're going to be actor, this one you're going to be a writer, this one you're going to be a producer, you're going to be a director, you're going to be a production assistant. And it just turned out that because of the voice and the acting and the writing... I did more of that. They they assigned me to be a producer on one which I was completely inept at, hated it. Right. And they assigned me to direct one which I hated and was inept at. <laughs> so when they would assign me to be the director on a film, I'd go to one of the guys who was assigned to be the writer who didn't want to write it, and I'd say, "Look, you direct it for me, and I'll write it for you." Right. And so. Now, when they heard your that. voice, were they just like you're? Narrator for life, or no, no, no. They they would, um, they would. um, You'd be assigned a different thing on each film. Oh, I know. I just mean with your. You've always had this voice, right? Yeah. So even as yeah, as the Woody Allen looking guy, you still had this voice. Yeah. So I'm surprised they weren't like, well, holy shit, you're you're the narrator around around seventh around seventh grade was when the voice changed because radio was so big. As an entertainment in those days in the 40s, I always figured that I could be a radio actor because uh, I didn't have, like, well, as I say, uh, Jake and the Fat Man, William Conrad, didn't look anything like James Arness. Right. 
Um, like, did you ever practice? Because I know, like, I was reading a biography. In seventh of... grade, I was the only guy who could do the Bud Collier Superman voice. This is a job for Superman. <laughs> so did you practice? Like... Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because I, I was reading a biography of, or autobiography of Martin Short, and he was talking about, like, in his attic, he would he would pretend to be all these characters and, you know, practice his voice and all this stuff. And I don't know if, is this something that... Fr- oh, no. I, 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 I practiced uh, yeah. that a lot. And... Uh, it was fun to do, but in in those days, uh, they in the afternoon they'd have the radio serials, fifteen minutes each of Buck Rogers, Superman, Terry and the Pirates, Archie Andrews uh, was was uh, big, but it was a comedy show, and uh, if it was crappy weather, you'd stay inside and you'd listen to these radio shows. And then at night, you'd have like Charlie McCarthy and Jack Benny and uh, Phil Harris, who's one of my favorites, and of course, Sam Spade and Michael Shane. Uh, so there was a lot of radio listening. People would just sit around in your living room and the radio would be there and you'd just be sitting in the chair and you'd be listening and absorbing right. all, of these, all of these great shows. Nice. And... Um, now, how did you, so getting to work in the field you obviously wanted to be in, in the Army. I mean, I I got those calls where it's like, join the Army. Uh, what do you want to do in life? I'm like, you know, I want to direct films. Oh, you can do that in the Army. It's like, whatever I want to do, you could do that in the Army. Yeah. But my biggest fear was me, no, I mean, I played basketball two years and I almost had a heart attack. So I can't imagine going through boot camp and everything. But what was your strategy? You had told me once, you said, oh, it wasn't a big deal because this was the strategy and you had sort of a strategy for getting through boot camp in the army, I believe. Oh, the thing was was uh, for the army in boot camp and so forth. One, I had the little bit of a break because I was a corporal, which was a non-commissioned officer, which meant instantly less work. But then I found out that if you were just as quiet and as unobtrusive as you could be, you would kind of become invisible and you'd always hope that there'd be some loudmouth who <laughs> would fight with the sergeant because he would draw the attention for away from you, which right. meant that you had to do a lot less work. So the, the key and, to getting through is just to try and be wallpaper, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I was, I was, I was terrific at that, <laughs> but I'd also found out that, that as a kid, if you were if you were wallpaper, you could get away with doing a lot of stuff that the more aggressive kids didn't do. Right. You know. So. So did, when you were in the army, you were doing this stuff. Did you ever work? I think. Did you tell me that you worked with Dick Cavett? Yeah. Well, Dick Cavett was an unknown uh, actor at the time. It was before he was still just a well. Let's see. In the before army. Before Beetlejuice. Right. How, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. How is how 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 in in I was born in 30, 34, and fifty seven, fifty eight, how old would I have been? About twenty years old. Yeah, well Dick Cavett 20, was about the, right. Dick Cavett was about that age and he was just an actor that was going from job to job to job and the army would hire actors from New York to do a lot of the uh things okay uh so i was in a film as essentially a spear carrier it was about the early days of west point and dick cavett was one of the actors with a major league speaking part in it and me and some of the guys that weren't working on a film up in television we the movie people would call us down and we would be spear carriers and extras for some of the stuff they were doing okay gotcha there was a very Terrific show they did. I forget the name of it, but Sue Ann Langdon was the female star of it, and she was one of the most beautiful women I ever met. Now, I'm not f- familiar if you're familiar with her or not. She made a lot of uh, TV series and movies. Okay. And she was, the co- she was the female co-star of this public relations series that okay. the Army was making at the time. Gotcha. And I was a spear carrier in that too. So, as as I say, uh, when we would be getting in makeup and costume for this West Point story, you know, 
all of the actors would hang out together, so we got to know Dick Cavett. Right. But he wasn't, I mean, he was working under the name of Dick Cavett, but he was not famous. He was just another working actor in New York making the rounds yeah. of stuff. Now, when you were in that Paramount Astoria Studios, uh, did you say when you got there they had like <clears throat> sets from Cleopatra and everything like still set up? That you could actually like go to the basement and see like Paramount had their oh that's where they had just still there they had all of the props were downstairs in this big huge thing and they had like all of the building sides and the restaurant sets and you would see like a restaurant that you'd seen in an old Paramount film and depending on the film the awning might be different or the win- what was written on the window would be different all right. but. It was it was real dark down there, and the the sun would come through the windows, and it would have that beam of of light, you know, through the windows, and it was so. You would go down there, and you'd see all of these sets for movies and props that that you had grown up seeing, and you almost expected to see Rod Serling step from behind one right, of them right. and say, you know, welcome and blah blah blah. That's so cool. No, it was like I say it. When I got ready to be discharged, I told the guy that wanted me to re-up, I said, look, if you can guarantee me that I'll stay here for four more years, I'll re-enlist. Because it it was like a, a master's and a doctorate. So, so do you feel like that was... But like... they wouldn't guarantee that, so I took my honorable discharge and so, came but, back to But do you feel like that was where you learned the most was through the, that time in the Army? Was oh, yeah. It trained you the most about your See, because they were, they were just learning special effects then. The only people doing special effects on TV in those days was Steve Allen and Ernie Kovacs. Okay. And because I always had wanted to be a cartoonist, a comic book artist of right. superheroes or science fiction, uh, what they could do... And in those days, the special effects were very limited, but what Steve Allen and Ernie Kovacs would do with them, I wanted to do. And they, since they were just learning this stuff like wipes and things like that were just coming in, uh, so I learned a lot about the special effects there. So I don't know if I've ever asked you this. So when you were in New York, <clears throat> and I know that you drew... Yeah, and you wanted to be an artist. Did you ever consider staying in New York to try your hand at getting into the comic industry or submit any of your art? Or no, I I would be what they called a gifted amateur. Okay. Um, it, it was I would grow up and I'd see things like Hal Foster who did uh, uh, Prince Valiant, and I'd see uh, Frank Frazetta who became my all time favorite. Right. Right. comic book artist and uh wally wood and frank frazetta and uh steve ditko and all of those guys uh i would buy like a lot of comics because i liked the art wasn't that interested in the uh story a lot of times right but i would buy it because i liked the art and the artist and uh, i had discovered frazetta maybe oh around maybe 40 1946 or 47. Anyway, he was doing this strip for a comic book. I forget what it was, but it was called Louis Lazy Bones, which was kind of a, a little Abner type of strip. And for some reason, they let him sign his name Fritz. Well, I'm in like sixth grade, and I see this guy. Wow, a guy named Fritz is actually yeah, that's doing cool. this. Because in those days... If you drew for comic books and you read, and the comic books were regarded as like one step above pornography. Right, right. And there was this huge dichotomy between where the newspaper cartoonists, the Al Caps, the Milton Kniffs, the uh, oh, Prince Val, Hal Foster, those guys were considered major league highly respectable artists and yet if you drew for comic books you were regarded sort of like a hack and you couldn't get anything else done and comic books are regarded as well to the point that a guy wrote a book called uh, seduction of the innocent and they had congressional hearings on comic books as the cause of juvenile delinquency i mean it's the same thing throughout history we're like you know, when the parental advisory explicit lyric sticker was a thing and Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister had to come defend and say, you know, you're you're making an assumption 
This isn't really like we are not the devil talking to your kids and all these guys. So I think throughout history, there's always someone that's going to see something that the kids are into and be like, oh, we're going to, there's a problem there. And well, try to well that's the cause it. of the problem. And, yeah, what, the yeah. The problem right well, it was the thing, I think in this <clears throat> book, the guy made the claim that Batman and Robin were having a homosexual relationship. And I think the, uh, Example, he said, was you always would see Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson in their bathrobes when they weren't being Batman and Robin sitting around. Yeah, and the people who were saying that probably were aroused by the bathrobes. (laughs) And And, (laughs) and also uh, Wonder Woman being, you know, a forerunner of lesbianism. Right. And uh, as I say, they had congressional hearings on them uh, about comic books being the... Cause of juvenile delinquency. Well, that's what that started the comics code, which yeah. is, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so, other than playing hockey on the river when you were a kid, you were never really into sports or anything, right? Oh, we were played... you more comics and movies and things, or were you. Well, all of the, all of the kids there were all of that. We played like in, in the summer, we played hardball or softball. In the winter, we would do the winter sports skiing, tobogganing, ice skating. Uh, in fall, we would do football. And all of this was Sandlot. Yeah, yeah. You know, Sandlot. Like, we had one, of all of the kids, one kid had a pair of, of, of uh, shoulder pads, and we would take turns wearing the shoulder pads. <laughs> helmets were not like the helmets they have today. They were essentially almost like a, a, a heavy leather flying pilot's helmet. You know, minus the I saw, like, right. leather minus heads. The, the, minus the, the yeah. goggles. Well, like movie Leatherheads with George yeah. Clooney. yeah. That's the kind of football helmets we had. Right. And we would take turns wearing the shoulder pads. Can you imagine wearing those on a motorcycle? Like, no, I'll do nothing for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing whatsoever. Right. But, yeah, so so what your interests were, what excited you to to be creative was was well, comics and movies at the like Like, when you were in the service, was that something that you saw yourself having a future in at the time? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was a thing that... Uh, before we started having kids, um, um, my wife and I were planning, you know, after, after the Army, we'll move out to California, Hollywood, and um, I would teach for two years, and we'd just live as cheaply as we could, and then for two years I would take off and just make the rounds. Like, while I was teaching, I would learn my way around L.A. and where the studios were, blah, blah, blah. And I would just spend two years making the rounds and not have to work because I had the money we'd save. But we started having kids. And that changed and, everything. Uh, so that changed everything and came back to... See, and in those days, if you got drafted, your place of employment had to guarantee you that when you got out of the Army, you'd get your job back at the same pay and... Your, your fringe benefits would be as though you had worked those two years you were in the Army, so they oh. would have increased, okay. et cetera. So, you know, you later on, you, you became a DJ for jazz. You know, yeah. Before, and then, so when did that whole, your interest in jazz start? Oh, that started... That well, broadcasting start, in general, as far as radio DJ in general. Yeah, yeah. when I was growing up, I mean, the, the big bands, the, the Benny Goodman... Uh, Billy Eckstein, uh, Tommy Dorsey, where Sinatra was, uh, Sinatra, Harry James Sinatra was, was first started off as a singer for Harry James, and then uh, Harry James passed him on to Tommy Dorsey, and uh, his career just grew from there. So we grew up listening to the big bands and the jazz people were all on radio. Then we moved to Baltimore, which is a good jazz city. They had like... Uh, Again, radio stations were segregated, so there were black radio stations and there were white radio stations, but there was a a black radio station that I liked that played like Charlie Parker and Miles Davis and Charlie Mingus and all of those, and and, uh, so that's what I listened to, along with all of the current pop stuff like uh, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Doris Day, Julie London, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it was kind of like when I was making the rounds in New York, I had three resumes. I had one as a writer for, for, radio, for um, radio, TV, and advertising. I had one as an actor, and then I had one as a narrator, just depending on where I was applying for a job is 
like on my resume, I had under uh, former employees and, and references, I had Dwight D. Eisenhower <laughs> president. <laughs> right. And I mean, this would just stop these people. I was, well, when did you work for Dw- President Eisenhower? I said, well, he was commander in chief and I was in the army, right. so he was my ultimate. <laughs> right, right. Never met him, but he was my ultimate. <laughs> right, and they right. all got a kick out of it, but I never got a job from any of them. Yeah. And then you also... Um, you I worked as an ad agent, see, writer, artist, full-time when I got out of the Army, when I came back to Columbus. Did you do any sales for ads? Like, did you do the voice? Like, you know, like in Mad Men, when they're like the, the ad agency... Oh, yeah, I, w- I, would and... do, I, would do, I would do freelance narrations, and um, I worked uh, part-time at Bliss College as a teacher, and I worked, uh, I worked at the ad agency full-time, nine to five, and then I worked at uh, radio stations in the evening, part-time and weekends. Started off at WMNI, and then went from there to WMNI AM, and then I went from there to uh, when WBNS FM started up. I had auditioned there maybe eight times, and they said, well, we like your voice, we like your sound, but you haven't had any commercial experience, so we can't hire you. And I'd say, well, how can you? I'd be hired if I can't get commercial experience. Yeah, right, so it was right. a real catch-22. Right. Not much has changed on that front. <laughs> <laughs> right. But see, M&I hired me kind of as a babysitter for their remote shows. But a lot of times the, re- the remote would get lost, and so I would have to fill in. And they liked my fill-ins so much that... Uh, a Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon showed up shift that they just said, yeah, you know, do you want to do it? So I did it. Okay. And because I did the MNI thing, when WBNS FM was going to go live, they just called me and said, hey, do you want the job? So that was that easy. The funny thing about your fill-ins and little things that you would do is, I mean, that's going to come into play later and be pretty, uh, pretty big part of you becoming... Uh, the voice on air during the movie too, as you jump in and say a little line, and yeah. people started. Yeah, you know, well, it was the thing. A little that, foreshadowing happened. Right? It was it was the thing that um, <clears throat> when I worked part time at uh, at WMNI, and I started there shortly after I got out of the army in September '59. I was working under the name of my two sons. Steve Fredericks, and that was my quote radio name. Oh. And then when they, when they got when they called me over to do it BNS FM, the guy told me he said, "Look, we don't want any names. We just want this disembodied voice that sounds like you doing the announcing. We don't want to hear what movie you saw last night or what your kids did or you know the BS that DJs would do." He <laughs> right. said, "You know, just take care of business." So I was unnamed on BNS FM, but uh, somebody wrote a couple of letters to the Citizen Journal asking, you know, who's the voice on BNS FM? We really like him, but he never says his name, blah, 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 blah. Well, the lady who did the radio TV column for the Citizen Journal didn't know that BNS FM didn't want a name given. So she called over to do an interview with me and I did the interview and then she did when she did the, the the her newspaper column it had my real name in there so that's how I got stuck with using my real name on the radio but the nice thing about radio was well to to go back I had auditioned at uh, BNS radio AM cuz in those days AM were the music stations mm-hmm. And I went, the first interview I had, you go in and they give you, oh, maybe five or six things to read. So you got like a couple of news stories, you got a couple of music inter- introductions and closes to do, you had a weather report, and uh, you had like, oh, a classical music thing you had to read. And I did all of this stuff, and it was great. And the guy who was the chief announcer at the time says, all right. I want you to ad lib now three minutes about what what the studio is like and what you're doing right now. Well, the word ad lib had just shown up, and we never had any training in it. Right. 
and I mean to say it was like this huge hole opened up in front of me, and I'm well, uh, I'm uh, in a in a in a studio here, and uh, in the corner there's a there's there's a piano, and uh, they use the piano in in it, so it was really horrible. Right. And I mean to say, after after I ultimately got the job, oh, a, a, a turntable wouldn't work or something. You had to ad lib, so I got to where I was good at ad-libbing from doing the radio shows. So when I got over to television, um, I had the, I got assigned to the shift that had armchair theater in it, and it always bummed me out that movie hosts never seemed to be watching the movie they were showing. Right. They'd have the movie host would be there, and there might be an, a, a, an artist in, so they'd have an interview with an artist that had nothing to do with the movie, so the host would be talking to the star or talking about what he had for breakfast or talking to a ball player or something like that, and then the movie, and all this bumped me out. These people never t looked like they were watching the movie, so I just started to ad lib about the movie. When it would come time to the break, they'd have like, the, they'd run, you'd introduce the film, run some film, then they'd have a break and you do your blah, blah, blah ad lib, and then they do the commercials, and then they go back to the movie. And so I just started one night, I just started to ad lib about the movie we were watching, and people liked it, and... Uh, do you remember what it was you said? Was somebody riding past the... Oh, yeah, shows? it was uh, Treasure of Pancho Villa with uh, Rory Calhoun, and he's outside, and he's robbing a bank. And he's just sitting there while his compadre is in there robbing the bank. And they rob the bank, and there's a shooting, and Rory and, and, and on the coach he's riding it goes shooting out of this old Mexican town and goes by this huge billboard that's Coca-Cola. And then it came up with the break, and I said, well, why didn't Rory rob, stop and have a Coke? It's the real thing. And <laughs> robbing right. a bank, you know, you, you need some refreshment afterwards. Right. And this was not, Coke hadn't paid you to do that. Oh, right? no, no, no. Not, <laughs> so. Right. And so people knew my voice from radio when they started to write letters to Fritz the Night Owl. W w Night Owl Theater was an unhosted thing other than these Dave Wagstaff cartoons of an owl watching the movie, going on a date, coming in from a date, fixing a sandwich, etc. And they would be music. And the, the announcer on duty would just say, we're watching... We're watching Ride Out for Ride Out for Revenge with uh, Mike McGrainer and Vitus, um, so forth, and then you would go to the commercials. So in that break, I just started to ad lib about the movie, like this was Ronald Reagan's fourth movie, or blah, blah something about the movie, and and uh, people liked that, and they started writing letters to be. They put my voice with the cartoon slide. And we'd get letters to Fritz the Night Owl, but there was no such person at the station. They just knew my voice from radio, and they figured, okay, that cartoon. So wait, so were you? So the Fritz the Night Owl name? Yeah. Was that from? Was that who came up with Fritz the Night Owl? Was that you, or was it was somebody the, at? That was the audience. The and okay. then John Haldy, the program director, approved of it, and Dave Wagstaff created the glasses, and. It was, we just went right from there. So, did, so in a way, the, the fans named you. I mean, yeah, that was, yeah. this was a fan-created thing. Kind of so when it came to the glasses, did you, were you the one that said, hey, I need a look or I need something, or did... Um, well, all three of us, Haldy, Dave Wagstaff, and I, we all discussed, okay, what is the owl going to look like on camera? And there was talk about an owl suit like the San Diego chicken. <laughs> but And you didn't go with that? <laughs> well We wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> no, one one of the one of the difficulties was was that <clears throat> it would have been tough to mic that That's not one of the only things. Thank God that's that the was only wrong with thing, it, but yeah. No, but <laughs> we also had to do commercials. And while a guy in a San Diego chicken outfit could sell something like uh uh, uh, oh, chicken. a sandwich, like a Big Mac or a pizza or something low price. You couldn't have a guy in a chicken suit standing next to, say, like a Buick or a DeSoto, <laughs> right, and right, so right. forth. Right. Um, and, and that was why, because I might have had to do commercials, 
the suit was junked and, and the Elton John glasses were big and uh, uh, Dave Wagstaff came up with that, went to uh, a drugstore called Revco, right. spun the sunglass rack around, found a pair that he thought would be good, took them off, added the horns and the broken mirror, and that was how the night owl look became with hey, the, just the glasses. Yeah, and good luck finding those on eBay because they're Christian Dior glasses and last pair I looked up was like, Three, four hundred bucks, maybe seven hundred bucks. I mean, it's yeah. really hard to find a pair of those now. Well, when 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 uh, Dave Wagstaff found them, they were like ten bucks. Right. And when it, we had a starburst filter on on the cameras, and so when he put the horns on the on the glasses, he broke up a mirror and glued the broken pieces of mirror onto the horns of the owl glasses. And because they were at different angles, you never knew when that starburst filter was going to pick up the the bright flash, so so that it was unpredictable. You couldn't; the flashes were not controllable. They just happened because of the mirror right. and the starburst. Well, anyway, the dopers loved. You know, when I'd be talking and moving my head a little bit, all of a sudden these blasts of light are going back into <laughs> <Dopes>. the camera. <laughs> right, they, right. They, they would write in and t- to talk about, the, you know, the artwork and the special effects I was using, and, and the, they loved the flash of the glasses. It was their own little light show at right. 2 in the morning. So before, before, you had, before you were Fritz the Night Owl, in that regard, I believe from 74 to 76, you were... Just the glow of your eyes, correct? In a booth, in the co- they, didn't you start slowly on camera? Like you kind of were this on camera. No. They had a lit announce booth about the size of say four telephone booths, and it had a a music stand for you for the commercial copy you had to read, or the promos like for Heart Fund or Cancer Society or Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the music stand, and then they had. One of the old long tubular mics, and so they would light up the booth, and the rest of the studio was black, and they would take kind of like a long shot, and you'd see this person with the mic in front of his face. You couldn't see the face because the mic was blocking it. Oh. And so for maybe before the glasses, we did that for a while, and then we went from that to where. It would be a dark studio, and they would key two owl eyes onto the screen, and then me in silhouette, I would have to sit behind, and they'd make it so that those two glowing owl eyes would come out of the silhouetted head, and I'd have to sit there and be completely still and do my blah, blah, blah. And then one night, I dropped my notes, and without thinking, I bent over to pick him up, and the two eyes just stayed on the screen, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and this body dropped down, and then they got the glasses and came up with the idea of the tower, and uh, that was it. So when you when you were doing the, um, would you and, ever get any pushback? Or like when you started at not ad libbing or just doing the stuff for between commercial breaks. Um, did you ever get any pushback from like management or anything? But the fans were behind you. Was there anything? Oh, like good that? point. Because when you were talking earlier about the rules of the radio, where don't go into your personal life, we don't care what you have to say, blah blah blah. I'll just do the business. Was that ever a factor when you started ad libbing on? No, um, because the the when I started ad libbing, the uh, ma- w- w- over the uh, Dave Wagstaff art, the uh, mail started coming in to. Like Flippo would get fan letters from people like, you know, show this movie or we like blah, blah, blah. Um, since since we were getting positive mail on it, Haldy's, uh, John Haldy, who was a program director, just said, look, you know, Let's go with say it. what you want. So you and didn't know you have to like, ask permission. They like, were, I'm going to do this. And no, no. Like, hey. they, they, let, they, let, uh, they let me pick the music, so I went from the music they were using to jazz stuff that I liked, that I, that I could talk over. And it was kind of a nice blend of word jazz. There was a guy that did records called Ken Nordine who had like two or three albums out. Great voice, great thing. And, and the albums were called word jazz. 
and um, you can still get them, and they're they're great if you're a jazz fan. So I kind of had that Ken Nordine approach of, of the music and I intertwining with each other. I, I'd pause, and a little saxophone riff would come in, and then I'd oh, start cool. talking again over the, you know, so... And none of that stuff was rehearsed, right? You no, it was all ad lib. It was all ad libbed. Like you never no. did you ever write anything down beforehand? Or? Oh, I would write down notes about, uh, oh, who was in it, or things I wanted to be sure to say uh, in my ad libs. So I would have notes, and then I would ad lib from them. Like I say, if it was Ronald Reagan's fourth picture and it was the one where he met so-and-so and got married or where Bogart met Lauren Bacall, I'd say right. this is the movie where Bogey and Bacall got married and blah, blah, blah. So, so, so just out of curiosity, so this was the age before the internet, before you could just go on a computer and Google this stuff. So right. how, what did you do for research? Did you... Like, because you you were on the you were on the air every day, or what? Six yeah. days a week, seven, or seven. seven days a week. So then, did you spend your day researching, or? Well, I, I knew. Well, again, we got to go back when I was in high school at Columbus North, in my junior and senior year in high school, and my freshman year in college. I worked at the Clinton Theater as an usher. Now, again, going back to the forties one of our main entertainments were the movies. So, I mean, right. in those days they had movie magazines, fan magazines that told you all this stuff, real or imagined, about the movies and the characters and things they were doing. So we had that, and I knew a lot about the movies from the 40s I saw as a kid. And then as a movie usher, they changed movies two or three times a week. And each night there would be the main feature, the second feature, and the main feature again. And since television was cutting into the movie audiences so much, a lot of times I'd just stand there on the aisle in my uniform waiting for somebody to say I lost my purse or what have you, and I'd just stay, stand on the aisle there waiting for somebody who needed an usher to help them for something, and I'd just watch the movies. And uh, so like a lot of the movies, Oh, I'd see the main feature maybe six times and the second feature maybe three times or four times a night. So I really knew a lot about these movies. Okay. And uh, so there was that. And, oh, just other stuff you'd, I'd see like, uh, oh, there, might, would, uh, there were a few uh, move, still movie magazines out. And, and uh, so I, I would do... Uh, Oh, and, and of course the Leonard Malton book okay. uh, I, I would also use. And I would use, you know, whatever printed stuff I had. And then also, when the station would buy a movie package, they would send, for each movie, they, they'd send a press kit that had the plot, the stars, and all kinds of information, still pictures, etc. So there was plenty of research. Okay. And I'd research each movie, and there'd be stuff I'd remember about it or that I'd learned from the press materials right. and so I'd research each movie make little notes about them and um, then ad lib from the notes okay and that was what you would do on air every night and then yeah. fan mail was good well, if there was the night owl was if, launched if, and... if there was if there was nothing if the muse wasn't with me you would just you know the music would come on and the Dave Wagstaff art would come on and you'd say uh, this is Armchair Theater. You're watching Ride Out for Revenge with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, and we'll be back in a moment. And if the, if the muse wasn't there, that was it. But if the muse was there, i just start ad-libbing, and Haldy's only requirement was say what you want, play what you want, just be able to hit the, hit the sign on when we come on at 6 o'clock in the morning, you know. And so going from, you know, the kid growing up in the small town through the Army, into communications, and now having your own show on WBNS was now the moment that uh, the Night Owl was officially born. So yeah. that's pretty great. That was episode one of Conversations with the Owl. Please tune in every Friday night as we sit here in the Owl Cave on Zontar and come directly to you live, 9 p.m. every Friday. Like, subscribe, uh, visit the Night Owl Square store at wntlchannelz.square.site. That's W never the luck channel Z dot square dot site. And if you'd like to check out further things from myself, Mike McGrainer music.com, 
You can also find uh, Vitis Brosdukas, uh, a published author. Uh, we will be talking with him more about that in future episodes. And uh, thanks, guys, and get ready for episode two. We'll see you next week. <laughs>